So I do want to thank uh, Michelle Rasmussen is here with us. She is our Dean of Students in the University and our leader of Campus of Student Life and the person who oversees athletics directly and she's with us here tonight. So I wanted to say thank you for her coming out. Um, in order to give some opening comments tonight, we did have a uh, pinch runner, I guess, come in <laughs> and uh, designated runner and uh, um, Michael Hayes is, has joined us. He is um, an assistant vice president for student, Campus of Student Life um, and vice president for Student Life. He was hired in 2016. Uh, Mike is a, le is a leader in Campus of Student Life and oversees the Center of Leadership and Involvement, Center of Identity and Inclusion, um, and the Office of International Affairs. He came to us from Washington University in St. Louis. But, <laughs> but he saw the light and he came north, so he's with us now. Uh, he also worked in campus life while he was there, and he's also been at the University of Maryland and Cornell University. So I want to welcome Mike Hayes to come up and open up our event. The school never to be spoken above a whisper, um, Washington University. So, hey, I'm thrilled to be here and offer greetings on uh, and a couple of thoughts from the folks in campus and student life. As Aaron said, I'm nearing my second, uh, ending my second year, and I'm so excited to continue to learn about this amazing place, quirky as it is sometimes, um, but amazing um, nonetheless. This is my second Ames event. I was there last year, and this is a really, really cool event. And. As Aaron said, in the event that you didn't know, I happen to come from that school down I-55 um, that wears red and green. Um, I am happy to say and report to you that I think maroon is a far better color. And so I tell you that up front. So, uh, it looks better with my hair to be gone. So let's start there. Um, so first of all, I just want to say congratulations, first of all, to our autumn teams um, for their great start. You've had a great start to the fall. Um, as a, and here's what we know of today, and here's some thoughts that I thought I was what excited me, because I am probably one of the administrators that I, comes to a lot of games. I come to a lot of, uh, of your events, um, that we have the number one ranked team in Division Three women's soccer right now, which is awesome. So. Um, our men's soccer team is ranked 14th as of today, um, and so um, 13th ranked Division Three women's volleyball team, which is awesome. And, um, and our women's cross country team is ranked sixth, and so that's just really great. You all should be very quite proud. And those of us in campus and student life, we're very, very excited for you. We're also very excited about a couple of things. One is that you chose to pursue your academics and your athletic passions at the University of Chicago, and specifically within D3 athletics, which I believe and is the purest and best model for, I believe, intercollegiate athletics. And so thank you for choosing to pursue those pursuits here with us. We're also glad that you share your academic and athletic talents with this larger campus community. We're better for having you here, and we just need a little more of your campus community friends to come out and support you. Um, and you have my assurance and our assurance at Campus of Student Life that we are going to continue to work on that because you need to have your fellow student support and that's important to us. Um, you also know that, and you know we notice, your commitment and discipline both as students and athletes is incredibly important and does not go unnoticed. Those of us in the administration, specifically within campus and student life, understand the significance of and appreciate you for not only for your, your athletic efforts, but your academic ones as well. And we also, and it's likely not expressed enough, appreciate how each of you represent your chosen sports, the Department of uh, Athletics and Recreation, and the university in such a positive manner. Each of us has a great responsibility, all of us have a great responsibility to uphold the integrity and standards of excellence of this university and you as athletes do this particularly well, so thank you. You are also guided by some amazing role models in your coaches, your athletic director, and her staff. And it's a pleasure to work with these colleagues every single day. Please join me in showing our appreciation for their commitment to you and to the university.
And again, I just want to say congratulations on your um, on the field or court, uh, as well as your classroom accomplishments. And I want to thank each and every one of you for all that you do for this community. Have a great remainder of the fall quarter, and go Maroons. Fellow University of Chicago athletes, coaches, and administrators, good evening. My name is Kelsey Moore, and I am president of the Women's Athletic Association. I'm here tonight to introduce our director of athletics and our fearless leader, Erin McDermott. Prior to joining the University of Chicago, she served as deputy director of athletics at Princeton University, where she oversaw the internal operations for 38 intercollegiate sports. Additionally, she has served on several national committees, including the National Association of Collegiate Directors of Athletics. Along with these accolades, she herself was a senior captain of the women's basketball team and winner of the school's Senior Scholar Athlete Award. She earned her Bachelor of Business Administration in International Business from Hofstra University and her master's degree in sport management at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. As she enters her fifth year here at the University of Chicago, the Maroons have captured nine UAA championships, four NCAA individual events championships, and four top 20 finishes in the Learfield Sports Directors Cup standings among 450 Division III institutions. And we have added women's lacrosse as the school's 20th varsity sport and entered into the school's first department-wide apparel agreement with Adidas. Suffice it to say, we are lucky to have someone who loves us enough to dye her hair maroon and can hear her chanting, Mo what, anywhere you go. Erin, <laughs> you are our leader, advocate, and constant support. Thank you for supporting us in all of our academic and athletic endeavors. Please join me in welcoming Erin McDermott. Thank you, Kelsey, and thank you all. Um, Kelsey had an introduction planned for President Zimmer, so she had to take me instead. So <laughs> thank you for doing that so last minute. I just want to say a few words, and then um, our keynote speaker will come up. And I know we have a great presentation ahead for our Aims of Athletics 2017 event. One of our football captains, Andrew Beatty, reminded me recently that it's important to understand the history and traditions of the places in which you choose to become a part. You all share connection with the, Mar the Maroons who came before you you will forever be part of something greater than yourselves. And now you bear responsibility to carry that legacy forward. I'd like to briefly highlight some of that history and legacy, beginning with our two pillars of that foundation. Amos Alonzo Stagg, a revolutionary figure in the sport of football and namesake of the Big Ten Football Championship Trophy, led the athletic department and served as the head football coach for 40 years. His declaration still rings true that winning isn't worthwhile unless one has something finer and nobler behind it. Gertrude Dudley was the first person to oversee women's athletics here. She believed, and we still do, that athletics develop self-control, unselfishness, a sense of honor, self-sacrifice, fairness, modesty, decision, courage, and a sense of responsibility. Of course, we all know Jay Berwanger, who won the first Heisman Trophy winner, Heisman Trophy in 1935, which is displayed in the Ratner lobby. Mary Jean Mulvaney was one of the first, if not the first, women to lead a combined intercollegiate athletics department overseeing both men's and women's teams in 1976. Edwin Hubble, a basketball player, invented the Hubble telescope, which was recently described on CBS's 60 Minutes as the single most transformative instrument that we've ever built in understanding what we now know about outer space. Including Edwin Hubble, we boast 11 Rhodes Scholars. And I hear we have four current candidates still in the running for this year's selection, so good luck to those of you. Numerous Maroon teams have won conference championships, and individuals have earned national championships. The University of Chicago was and is a place of great influence, including within athletics. As part of the academy, 
Athletics, by definition, must be educational above all, which is why we aim for you to become the best version of yourself through working collaboratively to reach performance goals, embracing diversity of thought and culture, persevering through failure with resiliency, and competing with integrity. We are all responsible for carrying the legacy of the Maroons forward. We owe it to those who came before us. We must inspire and support each other. We are united in Maroon pride, and we are hashtag Maroon made. Be authentically you. Don't play small. Play big. Play big in everything that you do. You are all awesome in your own unique way. Gain confidence in being and doing what makes you extraordinary. Mo what? Mo what? Come on, Mo what? All right. <laughs>
it, for me, it was the first time that I really felt I found like-minded people who worked hard, played hard, uh, really uh, academics was important to them, but they wanted to have that full experience of being an athlete as well. And so right after my Prosby visit, it wasn't too long, I did look at a few other schools, perhaps one south of 55. And I like to think I made the very best decision I possibly, possibly could. And that was uh, attending the University of Chicago. And when I came to campus in <clears throat> 1994, uh, it was after the Prosby visit. I was walking around campus. I remember it like it was yesterday. And maybe Coach Fitz remembers this too. But uh, they were proudly handing shirts out on campus that said top 500 party schools. And yet we were number 500. And I, A, I didn't understand why they were proud about that. And B, it made me very nervous. <laughs> Perhaps all of the really fun people that I met during my Prosby uh, visit graduated, or I couldn't quite, wasn't quite sure where they all went. But I uh, found out soon after that this was not the case, and I ended up having the most fun I possibly could have had, both on and off the court, and made friends that I still consider the closest friends in the world to this very, very day. Truly, the experience that I had here was unprecedented and changed my life for the better in so, so many ways. And so in preparation for this, I kind of went back through some old, uh, some old journals, some old drawers, and um, I thought what I'd do is share a little bit of what I found with you. Um, first of all, scarily enough, I did find the WashU scouting report from 1998, if any of the basketball players would like to see what that looked like. I was told by a few that it looks scarily the same. Um, I found my um, WA blanket day, which is one of the uh, happiest, uh, most proud days still to this day when I receive my blanket. And you talk about tradition, and that's such a special time for, uh, for all of us when that happens. And I found um, just some notes that I would share with you um, very humbly. So I, uh, this is back uh, in 1994. Well, I made it to college. It is now the very beginning of my fourth week here at UFC. It's probably not too similar, it's October 16th. Mm -hmm. And I love it. As I sit here and look at this spectacular view I have from my room, that was back when the Shoreland was still here for those that remember, I just know that I can do it. I can make my dreams come true here. And I just feel as if I can accomplish anything. I have this great feeling of inner peace and calm, but also an inner voice and feeling of inspiration telling me to go and reach for my dreams here. I know that things will not always be as beautiful here, as sunny as we're experiencing today, as they are today. And I also know that I have some really big challenges ahead of me this year and the years to come. But I also know as I look out there today that I will meet those challenges face to face. I will not step back, but instead I will pass through them. And I share that with you because many, maybe many of you who are first years are feeling that way. Um, maybe some of you have had to overcome some challenges. Uh, for me, about a year in, I faced some pretty significant challenges in that uh, my dad's business uh, didn't work out. He had his own company. And about a year in, and I am the oldest of four children, um, that didn't work out. And I remember one time actually being behind in tuition. Thank goodness for financial aid. Thank goodness for scholarships, which is why we will always pay it forward. Um, but I remember I had to practice one day on my own until I could get um, that the tuition figured out. And I just always remember sports being my outlet. It's bigger than yourself. You had said that, Aaron. It's, it's bigger than all of us. And I always found my team having those goals, working through reaching inside yourself and being something better and bigger because of who you're playing for. That all resonated and got, that got me through those tougher times. My uncle at the time uh, was my coach growing up in high school and grade school and he traded futures and options. And right after that freshman year, he said, I was a psychology major, but he said, well, why don't you try out trading? I think you might like it. And I remember thinking, I know nothing about trading. I always thought I'd never do business. And I remember then thinking, well, you know, I've tried these other things. Basketball's given me a lot of confidence. WA gave me confidence. My coaches and teachers and family gave me confidence. And so I said, let's give it a shot. 
And so through trading, I realized that I could do things to help the world. I could do, I could help my brothers and sisters through school. I could do other things that I didn't know were possible in the business world and beyond. And I feel that having that connection to sports really helped me in that world. And so I just thought I'd share with you a little bit about what I've learned in my last 19 years um, being on Wall Street of how business and sports and being out there, what um, being on the court and off the court, really, I learned from my time here. One, you win some and you lose some. It's true on the trading floor, it's true uh, in business, and it's definitely true on the court. But you always try again. Trades or business or uh, things can go wrong, you make mistakes on the court, but you always pick yourself up. You, nowhere do you learn more resiliency than what you're learning on the court right now. Teamwork. You don't know all the answers. Uh, you don't know them when you're playing on the basketball court. You don't know them in business, even after 19 years. And you learn that you find the best in your teammates. You ask them questions, they help you out. And nowhere better do you learn that than being in a team sport. Humbleness. You definitely learn that here as you're in your classes competing, as you're out on the field uh, competing as well. And definitely, I think that's one of the best characteristics that one can bring from this university into the world. Work ethic, no one works harder than a maroon in the classroom or out uh, on the fields. Breaking down barriers, which we're gonna talk about in a moment with our athlete. Time management. I think possibly this is one of the best things that I learned. Um, I thought time management was tough when I was sitting in your seats and now uh, managing uh, a career, three children ages 13, 10, and eight, uh, Special Olympics, uh, nonprofit work, and finding time for my old teammates and friends. Um, this is what prepared me for today. 19 years of working on Wall Street, and I will tell you, that besides my faith and my family, playing sports at the University of Chicago is one of the biggest single contributors to my success today. And uh, I am just so thankful for having those experiences on and off the court. Lastly, I'll tell you, if you haven't done this yet, thank your coaches. Learning feedback and how to take feedback at this age, that is gonna set you up for your future and whatever you decide to do. And your coaches have the best intentions at heart. They may deliver it in interesting ways at times. And trust me, I've been on my fair uh, side of that, both in the workspace and beyond. But if you can learn how to take feedback and make yourself better each and every day, your boundaries will be endless. Teammates, and you said it earlier, Aaron, being selfless is probably the biggest thing. It is so much bigger than yourself when you're part of a team, and that's what will take you the furthest. So as I started at Goldman, I missed the camaraderie that I had in WA and in what you're sitting here today. And WA is what gave me the courage to actually start a women's network at Goldman as a second year analyst. It has become a full diversity network today, and I will just tell you to embrace what you're learning on the court because you have no idea when and how you might use it in the future. Playing basketball here definitely taught me a lot about the sport, but it's taught me so, so much more about life. Lessons that I use to this day. I think lessons I use even more now than I did then. I learned a ton of these at University of Chicago, but one of the biggest lessons that I would like to share with you occurred during my sophomore year and it was because of WA. It was there that we began volunteering with Special Olympics. Uh, for those of you that don't know, Special Olympics is an organization that serves 22, in Illinois, 22,000 athletes with intellectual disabilities and 20,000 young athletes ages two to eight with intellectual disabilities. We sponsored a team, Coach Rush is out there somewhere. We sponsored a team, uh, Ada S. McKinley, and I immediately fell in love. It reminded me of the joy of sport, why we play. It reminded me of teamwork, truly helping each other out. Inspiration, what these athletes overcome each and every day. Bravery, one of the athletes I met had 30 plus surgeries and was still competing. Sportsmanship, to me it was what sports was really all about. At the track, 
when we were there the first time, I saw an athlete, a Special Olympics athlete fall. Immediately before finishing the race, three other athletes who could have went on to win stopped dead in their tracks, picked the athlete up, and they all ran together. That's what sportsmanship is. After the UFC, I volunteered for Special Olympics um, here and there. Uh, while I was at Goldman, things got very busy. And I ended up um, traveling to New York for about six months. I happened to be there during 9-11. I was about five blocks away from the World Trade Center when the first tower fell. I was running um, in my heels. It took me a long time to wear heels after that. Uh, I ran barefoot. I had a colleague who grabbed my hand, and we outran the smoke. But I will tell you, much like it shaped all of your lives and has touched so many of us, it forever changed my life in many ways. But when you live through something like that and you overcome something like that, something deeply changes inside of you. Everything else goes away and you see what's truly important. By the way, my teammates from UFC were the first to reach out to me that day and make sure that I was okay. What changes is you see what's important. And for me, I saw that when I came back, while yes, I could have this career, I wanted to make sure that it was a career that was there to help others. And that's when I promised that I would get more involved in the community and volunteer as much as I could. And that's when I became a board member of Special Olympics. The Lord works in mysterious ways. And several years after that, I was blessed with identical twin nephews. Uh, both my brothers attended UFC. They played football and baseball here. And my husband, now husband, at the time, he was my brother's friend playing football. Uh, and uh, six years, it took him six years to uh, ask me out, by the way. Um, <laughs> you can quote me on that. Um, but as, as I came back from 9-11, um, a lot changed. And my uh, brother ended up having identical twin boys who uh, had special needs. And I am proud to say today they are athletes, Special Olympic athletes. And seeing Tom, Tommy, my brother, high five his boys the first time they competed. Um, tears went down my face because he said it's the first time that his boys were seen in the light of what they could do, what they were capable of, and not what they were not capable of. I saw my kids fist bump their cousins and saw their abilities and not their disabilities. That's what sports does. It breaks down barriers. It shows people what they are able to do, not what they are incapable of doing. And so over the course of 15 years on the board, I've seen countless episodes of this. I've seen how sports can break down barriers. And I think that there is never more important time than right now with what we're seeing in our community in Chicago, in our community around the world, to break down these barriers, to bring our communities together. By changing community perceptions of the capability of different groups, through sport, children and adults, regardless of gender, regardless of ability, regardless of background, they can come together in a positive context, sometimes for the very first time ever. Maybe some of you have experienced this. And you can see each other in new ways, how they can accomplish things they had previously thought impossible. This helps reduce stigma and discrimination and it changes the attitude of gatekeepers who have the power to permit or deny children and adults the right to partake in these activities. By changing children's and adults' perceptions of themselves and their abilities, sports empowers people to recognize their own potential and advocate for changes in society to enable them to realize what they are fully capable of. I just had two quick stories I wanted to share with you before turning it over to Claire. And that is, um, I recently had the opportunity to go to Washington, D.C. for Capitol Hill Day. And uh, the person next to me, Zamira, she was the one who uh, spoke to the senators and the congressmen and women. What I didn't know about Zamira until she told her story was the following. Zamira was nonverbal um, until age seven or eight. Her mother had been told to institutionalize her. She had been to five different Chicago public schools in the course of her first eight years. In third grade, she was actually beaten bloody and bullied in the classroom. Her mom never gave up on her. 
At age eighth grade, Zamira, uh, her mom, uh, she saved up and moved her out to the suburbs to a place called Wabanzi. Maybe some of you are from there. And she joined what's called a unified school. A unified school is a school where athletes with and without disabilities play alongside each other to change the mindset of the community. It was there that Zanaira blossomed. She was called, now called the Rebound Queen. She uh, found a talent that she had in art, and she is now a copyrighted artist. She is a paid employee at Brookfield Zoo, and she is one of our lead global messengers, sharing her story out there with the world at age 21. This is someone who people wrote off. This is someone who has so many talents to share and has been such a huge inspiration in my life. If we can just give people a chance to show their abilities, there are so many things that we're capable of doing together. One other quick note, Sarah Boys. Sarah was a dear friend. Um, she passed away a couple weeks ago. Sarah was the very first person that I ever met on the Special Olympics board. She was a board member of mine for three years. She had intellectual disabilities, but she also sadly uh, passed away of cystic fibrosis after beating all the odds and living to age 38. Every day I met Sarah, she came out with a smile, no matter how sick, no matter how tired. She found a way to beat the odds. Her bravery out on the field, she was an equestrian, she was a track runner, she was a polar plunger. For those who haven't done that before, it's when you dive into the water in freezing cold temperatures. She did it all, and she did it all with a smile. And I share that because some days, you know, it can feel tough, like you have a lot on your plate. But when you see these athletes and what they're doing every day to overcome their obstacles, it's truly inspiring. And so in Sarah's uh, honor, I, uh, I just would like to encourage all of you to think about those blessings, think about what you are doing here each and every day, and be sure to live uh, to the fullest of all of your potentials. And before I sum, sum it up um, at the end here, I would like to ask Claire Grothy, our athlete, to come up and join me to share her story with all of you. Claire? Good evening. My name is Cleo Guilty, and I am a Special Olympics athlete and Global Messenger. My team is the Wolves. We play volleyball, basketball, floor hockey, floor foot flag football, soccer, and snowshoeing. I have been involved in Special Olympics for eight years. I know that many of you here have been or are athletes. But even if you're not an athlete, you likely have been on some sort of team. Before I joined Special Olympics in high school, I have never really been on a team. When I went to John Horsey High School, I was offered a chance to join the Special Olympics team there. Having the opportunity to get involved with sports team to be an athlete has changed my life. As you all know, being part of a team gives you instant friends. And while everyone on your team isn't your best friend, you do get to know them and you all develop a common purpose. That is to work together to get better and compete. We all know teams can be made up of very different people. My Special Olympics team, the Wolf, is made of the alum alumina from three different high schools, Horsey, Glenbrook North, and Glenbrook South. We have guys and girls. We have young girl and old. Oh, we have athletes from many different races and religions. We have highly skilled and we have beginners. The funny thing is, we don't even notice it because we are too busy having fun playing sports together. Sports and athletes are kind of sneaky that way. They make us not care about our differences. They have a way of letting us, encouraging us, and making us work together, have fun together, and compete together. The difference of individuals just don't matter. The thing normally seen as barriers are broken. We practice, play, and celebrate together because they're sports. We are on the same team. We are playing on the same field. We are on the same league. Look in the stands of any little league, high school, college, or professional game. What do you see? All sorts of people celebrating together. This is also true in Special Olympics sports. Aside from athletes and sports, breaking down the barriers with a team or 
school or a town, Special Olympics allow for barriers to be broken well beyond that. At any Special Olympic event, besides the team members and coaches, the supporting team families and friends will see many volunteers, even hundreds of them. Volunteers are the backbone of the Special Olympics. We cannot do without them, and the vast majority of volunteers come back and again. This community involved is another barrier broken. Over 30 years ago, schools started taking on their spe own Special Olympics team come partner club. Partners club are maintain mainstream students who volunteer to work with the classmates that are on the school's Special Olympics team today. See, this is great pride in wearing the same uniform colors as the rest of your school athletes team. Partners clubs continue today. It's pretty special for Special Olympians to walk down the school hallway and get high fives for the medals they just won. The relationship in schools are another way to have barriers broken. For several years now, now high school, college, and pro sports teams have increased their involvement with Special Olympics. Lastly, for example, from high school football team invited a couple of Special Olympians, flag football teams to attend a, a practice, and they lead them on to the field at the home football team. Football players from both Glenbrook North and Hersey had helped the drills and practice for the school Special Olympics flag football teams. Northwestern University recently hosts the Everson Special Olympics soccer team to a joint practice. Northwestern has also had our Special Olympics basketball team play a halftime of their own games, the home games. My team, the Wolves, have played a mini game at halftime of the Chicago Bulls game at the United Center. Many Special Olympic teams have had this opportunity of the, the years, thanks to the Bulls. This winter, the new Windy City Bulls are hosting scrimmage games at a and a skills clinic at the Sears Game Center for many Special Olympics basketball teams. This year, the Chicago Bears hosted a flag football volleyball at Hallis Hall for multiple Special Olympics teams. There are years the Bears have hosted Special Olympics athletes for t training camps. Now, some people do think, oh, isn't that nice of people to give handicapped kids a chance? Many of you think that the first time they experience a Special Olympics event. But like I said before, when someone volunteers, they are usually hooked. They are hooked on the positive spirits of the athletes. They are hooked on the great effort. They are hooked on the competitive athletes, the assignment, and the sportsmanship. And when a volunteer returns, another barrier has been broken. This increase in partnerships from the high school level to the professional level certainly is Certainly are examples of how sports and athletics lead the way in breaking barriers in our society. Finally, Special Olympics has spent the last year emphasizing unified unifi 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 sports. This is when a sports team is a combination of Special Olympics and non-Special Olympics athletes, and they compete together against other unified teams. Think of that. Wego and Special Olympics athletes compete side by side on the same team. Talk about having barriers broken. Sports and athletes have an, athletics have an amazing way of bringing people together, of breaking barriers down. Fam, friends, family, communities, cities, and as we can see in the Olympics and Special Olympics, even countries come together through sports. By playing and competing, competing and sports barriers are broken down. Thank you for allowing me to speak today. I hope to see you volunteer or coaching, uh, cheering at a Special Olympics event soon. Have a nice night. Thank you. So just in conclusion, you may be thinking, well, how does this relate back to where you're at in your journey as a first year, second year, third year, and fourth year? And I would just say, I look back on my life, 
and think about where all of you are sitting right now. And you're just at such an important part of your journey. You can use what you're doing for the greater good if you so choose. You can choose to include on and off the playing fields. I think it can be really easy sometimes to take your time here for granted. Maybe not your first year as you're getting started, but as you roll into the second and third year and you're studying for exams and it's really gray outside, it can be easy to take that time for granted. But I would just encourage you the next time when you start feeling that way and we are running the last lap or you're in preseason sprints or off-season workouts, think about these Special Olympians and what they are overcoming every single day to play the sports they love and to level the playing field both on and off the court. Sometimes I see over the years how sports can become a chore for people. Don't let it. Remember why you are here. Find the joy. Find your confidence. Find your perspective. Do whatever it takes to find those things and bring them back. The alums are here to help. Your coaches are here to help. I've never seen a more dedicated staff of coaches and leaders as you have in this room here tonight. Use them. Use your teammates. I would just share with you uh, in that journal when I was kind of looking back on some things throughout my collegiate career, there were definitely times I doubted myself or lost perspective. You kind of forget about that. You block that out. And for me, Special Olympics one of, was one of those things, and it continues to be one of those things that really helped bring things back into focus for me. So find whatever it is that brings what's important back into focus and perspective for you. If you get a chance, jot a few of these things down. You'll be so glad you did when you're old and 40 like me. Um, it really helps to kind of put things back and, and remind them where you're heading in the future. So as, as Aaron mentioned, uh, you have the uh, potential in this coming year to do some amazing things. And in a few years, you will be the ones hiring. It's hard to believe, in just a few short years, you'll be out there and you're gonna be the ones hiring. So question for you, will you be the ones really to reach out of your comfort zone like you did here so many different times on the playing fields to give someone a chance, maybe that looks different than you or thinks differently than you and give them a chance to be a part of your, your staff and your squad? Are you doing that today? Those are the things that we need to remember that we take down and break down the barriers that are on the court and we bring them off the court as well. I know you will do that because you're University of Chicago Maroons and that's what we do. And I also really hope that some of you will consider being a part of Special Olympics in a volunteer fashion if, it, if you feel moved to do so. This is an incredible time to do it. It's a once in a lifetime chance um, in that we are embarking on the 50th anniversary. Uh, a lot of people don't realize that Special Olympics started at Soldier Field July 20th, 1968 with Eunice Kennedy Shriver and Justice Ann Burke, two amazing women. There were a thousand athletes. Back then, athletes mainly Special Olympics athletes were institutionalized, and these women felt that they deserved to be seen and that their potential needed to be developed. Fast forward 50 years later, there's five million athletes now globally participating in Special Olympics, but we have so much more work to do. There's 220 million intellectually disabled people across the globe, and sadly, just a couple weeks ago, I heard a horrific story of a young boy in Africa who was literally roped to a tree who had special needs because they didn't know what he was capable of. If we can each reach in each other and see what we're capable of and pull together, break down those barriers, I know that there's so much more potential. So come out um, July 20th of next year, you'll see the next 50 years in the making, which is 
Claire leading the effort, and Claire uh, here taking us to the new levels. We're going to have an eternal flame of hope that's resurrected at Soldier Field, for those that are familiar, right outside McFetridge at the stadium. It'll be lit that evening. We're going to have a global day of inclusion on July 21st. DePaul has uh, already said they'd get 200 volunteers out there. I'm convinced we can beat DePaul on that. And we're going to have a concert to signify uh, people coming together in an inclusive way and think about the world for the next 50 years and where we can go from here. And I guess I would just leave you with this. As you continue on your journeys here at University of Chicago as student athletes, it's the Special Olympics Oath. And I would like to ask Claire to come up and help read it with me. Let, let me win, win but if, if I cannot win, win let, let me, me be brave, brave in the attempt. attempt. I wish you all a season ahead of reaching beyond your goals and dreams and being brave in the attempt to become the best that you are each capable of becoming. I thank you so, so very much for your time today and for this incredible opportunity to be here with all of you. And I wish the Maroons a great season of success ahead. Go Maroons. Wow. Wow. <laughs> I have really nothing I can add. Um, amazing messages, I think, just gets to the core of why we do what we do, finding the sheer joy in those moments. And um, when things are hard and when things are rough, it just makes those sheer moments of joy all the sweeter. So um, I just want to thank Again, um, Jenny for joining us, Claire for joining us, and her coach is here as well for joining us. Um, a really special message and event. I hope um, some of you can potentially contribute to the games this summer um, or at least find opportunities where you can get involved. And whatever your passions may be, as Jenny said, it is so important um, that we continue to feed our own, kind of nourish our own souls and what really speaks to us. So. Um, I think you heard a lot of just the ideals of really where sport can do for society, as we all know, breaking down barriers, unifying community, um, just being, again, a source of joy and excitement for everyone that is there and involved and connected. So with that, I hope you all feel inspired. Um, go out into this wet night and have smiles on your faces. <laughs> And thank you for your time and attention, and go Maroons!